am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the Jewish Policy Center and your host. As many of you know, and there are a great many of you <clears throat> on the phone today, the JPC is a 501c3 nonprofit organization providing analysis of foreign and domestic policy by leading scholars, academics, and commentators. We support a strong American defense capability, U.S.-Israel security cooperation, and missile defenses. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, and energy security, as well as free speech and intellectual diversity, uh, two things we're really pushing this season. This is the first JPC webinar of the fall 2020 season. In the spring and summer, we brought you some really outstanding speakers, Richard Goldberg on snapback sanctions, award-winning journalist Claudia Rosette on the Hong Kong uprising, Daniel Blumenthal, one of America's premier China hands on China's initial response to the Wuhan virus and China's broader goals. Dan, by the way, will be back with us later this month. Watch your emails. Uh, IDF Reserve Brigadier General Asaf Orion on the U.S.-Israel security relationship and the changes that each country is undergoing as um, in its relations with China. Scholar of Islam Harold Rode on Turkey's determination to enhance the Islamization of Jerusalem. <clears throat> We've had Ilya Shapiro, Jonathan Shanzer, Doug Fife, Michael Duran, and more. And we promise no less for the fall season. In our great eight-month-old tradition, we are bringing you another outstanding guest today, IDF Reserve Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. He is also the head of, wait for this, the Institute for Research of Intelligence Methodology at the Israeli Intelligence Community Commemoration and Heritage Center. It's a huge mouthful and I say it all because it's very important, number one. It's also a terrific place to visit when you next get to Israel, and I hope some of us or many of us will get to Israel in the coming year or look it up online. It's a great resource. He is actively involved in organizations that support Israel and those that fight against anti-Semitism and anti-Israel initiatives. Cooper, as he is better known, was the former director of the uh, Ministry of International Affairs and Strategy. He served as assistant defense attache for intelligence at the Israeli embassy in Washington intelligence officer for the IDF Central Command. I think that's where we first met many, many years ago and held senior positions at the IDF Directorate of Military Intelligence, where he's had significant uh, role in determining Israel's methods for coping with terror, as well as regional developments and sharing analysis with the US and other foreign partners. He's been a contributor to a wide variety of publications and he appears in various Israeli and international uh, newspapers. We were pleased to have him in the summer issue of In Focus Quarterly. You can read his article there and all of our publications, Insight Articles, the In Context blog, Alliance Tracker, Frontline Defense, and In Focus on our website at www.jewishpolicycenter.org. That's www.jewishpolicycenter.org. So you will notice that you were muted that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you, uh, but we wanna hear from you in writing. So if you have questions for a speaker, please send them during the program to info at jewishpolicycenter.org. That's info at jewishpolicycenter.org. And I know you will have questions. Uh, Israel's agreement with the United Arab Emir Emirates, formerly known as the Abraham Accords, is a tremendous achievement. When Egypt made peace with Israel, when Jordan made peace with Israel, they were met in the Arab world with a cold shoulder. Anwar Sadat paid the ultimate price for visiting Jerusalem. The UAE, on the other hand, seems to be right in the middle of an emerging Gulf state consensus. So with that, Cooper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ashana, and thank you for everybody who's listening. And uh, yes, uh, I think uh, the, the, the gist of what I want to say is exactly what you just said. That, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I, I won't stop at the gist, <laughs> I'll elaborate on that. So really this is a different thing that uh, we are experiencing now. It's not the same, well, every piece is important, every piece is really exciting. Uh, for Israel who always dreamt of uh, having peace with its uh, neighbors, 
uh, any kind of progress towards peace and every peace agreement is, is something really uh, that uh, makes us feel so elated. elated. But uh, saying that, this peace is a little bit different. And in, in some respects, it's, it, this is the game changer we were waiting for so long in our relations with our uh, environment and, uh, and our neighbors. Because for the first time, and this is the most important new attribute to this piece, is for the first time this is planned in order to be a warm peace. It's not peace that is based on ending some war and uh, we have to give, give back some land and uh, we have to take upon ourselves all kinds of political uh, decisions that are not difficult to sell at home. Uh, this time, it's, uh, it's an, a very easy sell. Everybody likes it on both sides, not only in Israel, also on the other side. When Egypt uh, made peace with us, everybody uh, boycotted is, uh, Egypt in the Arab world. And uh, it was uh, uh, sent out of the Arab League for a while. It's, uh, today, we are in a, in a totally different and opposite situation. It's, uh, today, it's the Palestinians who cannot convince the Arab League to, co to convene in order to discuss this matter. It's uh, definitely not to, to take any measures against the UAE that is out of, out of the question. If anybody is going to take steps against the other, it is the uh, Gulf states against the Palestinians because uh, they are upset with their uh, reaction to the, to the agreement. And uh, the uh, Palestinians have just uh, informed the world uh, yesterday that uh, following everything that's happening, the Arab states have stopped giving the money. Not that they gave them that much before, but uh, they, uh, they are not giving them anything. Because so the, the, the onus is now on the Palestinians to prove that they are all behaving themselves and not on, on the UAE. Uh, and definitely not in the Gulf, as uh, Shoshana said, definitely not in the Gulf. In the Gulf, what we hear from people from the Gulf is, is amazing, really amazing. What we hear from them is that this is the right thing to do. It's not because it was imposed on them. It's they do it because they want to do it. And they, they expect the Palestinians to do the, to do the same because they are, they are full of criticism of the Palestinians. And they say that, uh, yes, Israel has a right to exist. Israel, the Jewish people is a part of the Middle East. It has a, his history in, in the Middle East, his history in the land of Israel. And uh, we should accept it. And uh, the Palestinians should adopt a different approach to the conflict. And uh, yes, they, are, they did it also in order to prevent Israel from uh, extending its sovereignty over what they call annexation over parts of Judea and Samaria and uh, the Jordan Valley because they want the Palestinians to have a greater uh, chunk of land uh, for their future state. But if they expect the Palestinians to accept that on the, on the other part of uh, the land of Israel, where there's going to be Israel, uh, it's going to be a land that run by the Jewish people. And, uh, and the uh, Palestinians should understand that there's not going to be any return uh, to, these, uh, to these areas by the descendants of the refugees and to stop uh, this uh, dreaming uh, while awake about uh, the possibility of something like that happening. And these are messages coming from uh, openly from uh, scholars and from politicians uh, in, in the Gulf states, including from Saudi Arabia that have not yet made it all the way towards uh, peace like the, like the Emirates, but is moving in this direction. And uh, when, when Palestinians hear that, they, they go crazy because they understand this peace is so different. It's everybody's talking about the cooperation we are going to have, people to people, tolerance, uh, economic uh, opportunities, scientific uh, uh, new peaks that can be uh, reached, uh, all kinds of things that when we had peace in before never were never mentioned. When some dreamers like uh, Shimon Peres were speaking about the new Middle East, but uh, but most people were very skeptical. And, uh, and now this is something that is within reach. And this is something really uh, new and important and a game changer in the, our relations with, the, with our neighbors. Now we have to remember the second issue is not only the warm peace, it's going to make it possible for us to achieve one of the basic uh, dreams and the, and the strategic goals of, uh, of Zionism, which is to be integrated into the region. And, uh, and, you know, when, when Herzl had this, uh, wrote his Alt Neuland, he spoke about the fact that he didn't realize, he, he never thought that the Arabs would uh, oppose the Zionists when they come. 
because he thought that, wow, the Jews will come and so much uh, prosperity and, and uh, new opportunities are going to be opened for the Arabs living around them, uh, that they will probably hug those Jews and be very friendly to them. And, uh, and for the first time after 120 years, uh, finally, uh, the other side realizes that and really wants to, to make this happen. And it's really up to us. We have to prove that uh, joining hands with us is really uh, fruitful and, uh, and pays off for, for those who do that. But, if, but I believe we can do that. And once we do that, I think that uh, we shall see more counties coming in and joining up. Of course, not everybody is going to do the same thing that uh, the UAE did because the preparation of the minds and the hearts in the UAE was much uh, greater than, any in, than in any other place. Uh, the UAE was open to Israelis for, for a long time. Uh, the UAE uh, was preaching for tolerance for a long time. Uh, so it was easier for us to, to, to make it for the uh, UAE to, to, to go on board, to come on board, and for easier for us to reach and, and con connect with them. As a matter of fact, I must say that I know, I know very few Israelis who don't have a friend in the UAE. Uh, <laughs> if you don't have a friend in the UAE, something is wrong with you. Uh, so uh, immediately, I believe that there are going to be all kinds of uh, open cooperation and, and economic uh, fields and uh, scientific fields and others. Tourism is going to flourish for uh, So th this is uh, obvious. But so not everybody is in the same stage. But other countries are going to follow suit, and uh, we can expect not necessarily full normalization, but also partial normalization is highly appreciated here. We we can appreciate that too. So we see the Sudan, we see Bahrain, we see Oman, and most of all, we see Saudi Arabia by allowing Israeli flights first to go to Abu Dhabi. And then yesterday they announced they're going to let Israeli flights to fly over Saudi Arabia to wherever they want to fly. And uh, to somebody who flew once from uh, Israel to Australia, I can tell you this is crazy. Uh, so it's, uh, this is a, a, a sea change for, for Israel in the understanding that you, you're not blocked on, on your east, uh, east side, eastern side, you can actually cross and uh, go to China, to India, to uh, Australia, to wherever you like. Much shorter, much cheaper. It's the, the impact of that on our economic uh, uh, capabilities is going to be immense in my mind. And uh, so it's, it's not, we broke this glass ceiling that uh, prevented us from uh, moving forward. And this is the last, the third issue that I want to speak about, this, the glass ceiling. For many years, everybody was telling us, listen, you cannot uh, have normal relations with the Arabs unless you succumb to the Palestinian uh, whims of uh, forcing you to go back to those who know Israel, to go to back to road six, uh, which is go back to the 67 lines and put yourself in extreme danger. Only if you are un under extreme danger, you can have normalization with the, with the Arab world. This was the idea behind the Arab Peace Initiative, as it's called, but which was, this is a very strange uh, name, because in fact, it was a dictate to Israel how to uh, give up and uh, take uh, upon itself an extremely dangerous situation. And uh, here we proved that, that this ceiling was fic fictional. It wasn't a real ceiling. I was saying that for, for many years now, uh, and I always believed that this is possible. Uh, but uh, most of the time I was laughed at, I must say. And, uh, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to see that uh, what I preached for a long time is actually happening. Because, yes, we can make peace with the Arabs because the Arabs are, for a long time, not, not from yesterday, for a long time, they have a much more important issue than the Palestinian issue and where is Israel going to, uh, to be and where the Palestinians are going to be. The Sunni pragmatic state are fighting against radicalism. That's the most important thing. And Israel has a, a certain virtue that nobody else has. Israel is the only powerful state in the world that you can rest assured that it will always be on the side of the pragmatists in the battle against the radicals. Not even the United States, who is the second country that can be, uh, can be counted on, uh, is for sure on the side of the pragmatists. The, the Arabs know that extremely well. Eight years of Obama explained to them extremely well that you cannot rely on the Americans. And, uh, and the only country you can count on is Israel. And Israel 
is ready to do whatever is necessary in order to fight radicalism. If it, if it takes some sort of uh, military move or kinetic attacks on, uh, on the radicals and uh, developing the capabilities to fight them by uh, developing the intelligence capabilities and so on, Israel has it. And Israel is ready to share it with the, with the pragmatic camp. So it's, uh, this, this led the, the, the pragmatists to understand that what they need to do is to join hands with Israel. Now, Israel has to be, to be paid for that somehow. It's not uh, that you can uh, just uh, be given all kinds of goodies from the Israelis and give them nothing in return. So the, the, the thing that Israel was asking for was normalization, open normalization. And uh, the, the, the stars aligned in a certain way in the last uh, couple of months that made it possible for the uh, pragmatists to say, as led by the UAE, and the UAE is the most prominent pragmatic country uh, because its, uh, its mouth is where its money is and where its heart is. And, uh, and uh, it is ready to, to fight, and it fights on all the battlefields that the pragmatists are involved in. And, uh, and because of that, for the, for the UAE, it was clear that they have to be the first uh, to move in that, uh, in, in that move. And uh, by that, they actually broke this glass ceiling. And this is extremely important because once it's broken, there's no way back. And uh, once it's broken, the direction is just getting more and more uh, developments in the same direction. As I, as I said before, we expect more countries to join in. And, uh, and it, uh, the timetable is not clear, but it might be sooner than later in my mind, uh, because all, all kinds of uh, considerations that uh, have nothing to do with the, really the relations between us and them, but with the way they analyze the situation in, in the United States uh, before the elections or after the elections, and uh, all these kinds of things can, can have an impact on how close and how fast they're going to, to move. So this development is, is, is a real game changer in the relationship between Israel and the Arab world. Secondly, it is a game changer in the relations between Israel and the Palestinians. The Palestinians, for all, forever, since uh, 100 years ago, uh, held in their hands two veto powers that uh, were the main assets with which they prevented any capability to move, to, to move towards uh, peace that is acceptable to Israel uh, because they, first of all, had a veto on any ch agreed upon change in the, on the, fee, on the uh, underground. You cannot make peace, you cannot divide the land without their, uh, divide the land in an agreement without their, without their acquiescence. And uh, secondly, they uh, held the veto about uh, normalization. You cannot have normalization with the, with the rest of the Arab world unless you succumb to our demands. And their demands are very clear. They want uh, state uh, in the 67 lines uh, with Jerusalem as its capital and the right of return accepted by Israel. And uh, they don't have to accept Israel as nation state of the Jewish people. That's the most important element so that they will continue the struggle against Zionism, even after they have a peace agreement. That, because for them, a peace agreement is something in the context of the phases theory that is just phase one in, in, uh, in, in the full plan of two phases. And then will come the second phase in which they will liberate uh, the rest of the land. That's, uh, that was their, uh, that was their demand. And if you don't do that, you cannot reach an agreement and you cannot have normal relations with the Arabs. What happened in the last year was that those two vetoes were shaken dramatically. First of all, with the uh, peace uh, plan of the US that directly threatened the first veto. We are going to change the situation on the ground with or without you. And uh, that was the issue of extending Israeli sovereignty over 30% over of the territories. Uh, that Israel uh, took in 67, and, uh, and the Palestinians were extremely afraid that uh, they will lose this uh, veto power, and they have not regained it yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's left in a limbo. And, uh, and the second thing that uh, was threatened uh, was the veto about normalization. Now, the Palestinians knew that this veto was under threat for a long time now. Abu Mazen in the last four or five, year, or five years speaks about it again and again and warns the Arabs, don't do that, don't do that. And uh, this creates such a crisis in the Palestinians because 
we told them not to do that. We begged them not to do that. And they did it nevertheless. The, the, the feeling of failure is, is doubled. If, if they, nobody spoke about it, maybe they, it was just a surprise. But we knew it was coming and we did everything in order to prevent it. And in spite of that, it happened. This is a, even a bitter, a more bitter uh, uh, pill to, to swallow. And, uh, and this is where the Palestinians stand today. They lost totally one of their vetoes. And uh, the other one is shaking. And uh, because it, the, the issue of extending sovereignty was suspended. The, the Arabs want to say it was suspended for a very long time, but, we, but nobody knows for how long. It's, uh, it depends on so many things. And it depends first and foremost, I would say, about on the, the, the way the administration wakes up in the morning. Because in the, in the last uh, couple of months, they woke up on, on the left-hand side and uh, they pre actually prevented us from moving uh, forward with, with the extension of sovereignty. And instead, they gave us a compensation prize, which is the normalization, which is a very good prize. We don't have any complaints. Uh, so, uh, but for the Palestinians, it's a major weakening of their position. They don't have any bargaining chips anymore. It's, uh, in, in fact, what happened was that whereas before the agreement, the two options that were discussed again and again and again and again by Clinton, by uh, Kerry and Obama, by many others, were either you go back to Road 6 or you stick to the status quo and you pay all kinds of payments for sticking to the status quo. We are going to, to be to have cold uh, shoulder attitude towards you. We can from time to time throw you under the bus like we did in, uh, in resolution 2334 of the Security Council that was adopted when uh, Obama was already a lame duck. And uh, we, we shall punish you for, for not moving to road six. This is, uh, these were the two options that Israel had to, to look at. Today, the option of moving back to road six is off the table. If there is one option that's off the table, it's not the, the uh, extension of sovereignty. The option that's off the table is the option of going back to road six. And this is what drives the Palestinians crazy, because if this option doesn't uh, exist anymore, then where are they going? And the fact is that it doesn't exist anymore, because no Israeli is going to now move uh, to Road 6 uh, when we already have peace with the, with the Arabs. Why would we move to Road 6? Normalization is already achieved. And uh, the, the other option is uh, ending the suspension and moving towards extending the sovereignty in the context of the peace plan. The peace plan, as Jared Kushner, Kushner said yesterday, and he's right, uh, the, peace, uh, the, the peace plan is speaking about two states and about uh, Palestinian state as well. But it is speaking about two states for two peoples, not the Palestinian version of two states living side by side in peace without having any of them the, uh, dedicated to the Jewish people because they believe that Jewish, Jewish people doesn't exist. So uh, there, there can't be a state for the Jewish people that doesn't exist. No, this is, these are two states for two peoples and, uh, and the Israeli security is guaranteed in a uh, wide uh, variety of uh, security arrangements that guarantee that Israel is going to be safe, even if there are two states. That's uh, the, the kind of arrangement that is left on the table uh, for, uh, for the Palestinians to decide if, whether they want to choose it. Even if uh, Biden is elected, I don't believe that Israel is going to all of a sudden say, yeah, okay, for, let's forget it uh, and uh, go back to road six. This is, this is I mean, no Israelis in favor of that, but uh, with, with the exception of the merit and the, and the, the joint Arab list. But, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not in the cards anymore. That, that's, we got rid of this the extremely dangerous uh, suggestion that the Europeans and the, some elements within the Democratic Party in, in the United States, and, uh, and of course, the, some Arabs, and definitely the Palestinians, wanted to push us to. So this is a major change and the, the capability of the Palestinians to change it are limited. I won't say zero, they still have all kinds of assets. Uh, they, still, they are still there, they can uh, resume their uh, struggle, their arms struggle. Uh, they can do all kinds of things. I'm not saying that they lost everything, but uh, they lost some major powers that they had. And uh, the, the important thing about it is that now that they've lost it, there is a greater chance 
that what the Americans and the Israelis were trying to, the, the message that the Americans and Israelis were trying to convey to the Palestinians throughout the last four years, that they have to rethink about their narrative and adopt a narrative that is not based on fraudulent and uh, all kinds of uh, lies, uh, fraudulent uh, assumptions and, uh, and lies, in order to make peace possible, maybe some Palestinians eventually will start saying, well, we cannot keep dreaming about uh, reconquering Tel Aviv. It's, uh, we have to, uh, to adopt some other, uh, some other approach. And, uh, and this is the message they're getting for the, from their friends in the, in the Arab world. Adopt a different approach. So now it's not only the United States through uh, recognizing Jerusalem as a capital, moving the, cap moving the embassy, uh, cutting aid to the Palestinians because they pay salaries to terrorists and then so, so many other moves that uh, the, accepting that uh, the settlements are not illegal per se and so on and so forth. And actually saying this is not a Palestinian land, uh, the, the, the Palestinian occupied land, the, the land that Israel took in 67. These are disputed lands that Israel has a very strong claim for. It, uh, these are all messages to deliver to the Palestinians in order to make them realize that uh, they are defending a lost case. Uh, but uh, it was not enough. Now is the UAE doing that, and if, especially if Saudi Arabia joins in. This is the big prize. Uh, if, but look, the, the, the Egyptians are not against it. They are in favor of that. It's, uh, so many Arabs speak in favor of this move. So many Arabs and, uh, are telling the Palestinians, listen, you have to change. You have to change your attitude. So there is a chance, small one, uh, remote one, not going to happen overnight, but there is a chance that they will eventually say to themselves, okay, so let's think it over, and uh, maybe we will have to adopt a new policy. This, the chance that this is going to happen are going to rise considerably if Trump wins, but uh, I think if Biden wins, they are, they are going to continue with their own uh, with their uh, old uh, approach, but uh, but who knows? I don't know what's going to happen in the United States, and I think nobody knows. Uh, just last uh, couple of words about uh, the regional impact of what happened. As I said, the UAE did it not only because of our blue eyes, and we don't even have blue eyes. So it's, uh, the 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 reason they did it was that in, they wanted to strengthen the pragmatic camp that they lead in its confrontation with the uh, radicals. Both, for them, by the way, it is more important to face the Muslim Sunni radicals, especially the Muslim Brotherhood. These are the, the real enemies they, they focus on uh, because the UAE has a very complicated relations with, the, with Iran. Uh, but, uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood, you say Muslim Brothers to, to a UNE person and he's immediately ir totally irritated, especially if you mention Erdogan or Qatar. It's, uh, this is, you shouldn't uh, mention them to them. So it's, uh, here they, they believe that they will be stronger in confronting these. And Iran, of course, Iran as well, is a major threat for them. And they believe that Israel is a, is a force that uh, will help them a lot in confronting the, the Iranians. And uh, I think they have some sound logic in that. Uh, because that's what we do most of the time, we fight the Iranians. Uh, and uh, I think by, uh, they believe that Israel joining the pragmatic camp is one thing that's going to improve their uh, capabilities to, to fight in those variety of uh, arenas where they fight the radicals, and uh, will also improve their, their situation in Washington itself. They did something great for the administration, for, not only for this administration, for the United States. Everybody in the United States, I hope so is in favor of uh, normalization between Israel and the Arab world. So they did something big for the United States and they expect to get something in return. So of course, first and foremost, they want some military goodies uh, and uh, the F-35 is something they have their eyes on. Uh, even if this doesn't happen or it, it, is, uh, it is coming in with a reduced capability or whatever, uh, it's, uh, they're going to get something, something that is important. Uh, in return for that, and their, their position in the United States as somebody who uh, should be uh, compensated for the courageous move they took is, is I, can, I can say that it's almost guaranteed. So it's, uh, it's a good move for the pragmatists. Now, of course, much depends on what happen, what's going to happen on November 3rd, 
but uh, because the attitude of the old uh, Obama regime, I don't know to what extent this is true, it's going to be true with Biden, but, uh, but the old Obama regime was clearly against the pragmatists and favoring the radicals, especially the sophisticated, the, rad the realistic radicals, of course, not the ultra radicals like ISIS and Al Qaeda, but uh, Rouhani and uh, Zarif in Iran, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey and Qatar, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in, G in uh, Egypt, uh, when they were still uh, forced to reckon with. Uh, these were the, the cup of tea of the former administration. So I don't know how this is going to play, off, to play out after the, after the elections, but uh, we shall see. But the Emiratis believe that this is going to help them regardless of who's going to be elected in the, in the United States. They hope at least so. And uh, so this is a major development. All in all, it's a game changer on all these, on the Palestinian side, on the Israeli-Arab relations, Israeli relations, and on the pragmatic camp uh, posture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, enemies. And this is, by the way, the reason why Turkey and the, U and the Iranians are uh, scratching their heads and cursing everybody around, uh, because they are really disturbed and uh, frustrated with what happened. So it's a, it's a big move. It's a big move, a big important move. And, and how, to what extent is it going to be important depends on us, on America and on Israel. Are we going to make it clear that it pays off to be our friend? And, uh, the Russians are very good at that. Uh, Israel, so-so. The Americans, quite bad. So uh, let's see if, uh, if we can come up to the, to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great place to stop. Um, we have a lot of questions. Let me just say to people who sent questions, if your question contains the word election, America, Biden, or Trump, we're not taking it, okay? We don't do electoral politics. Thank you for the question, but it's, it's just going to sit there. So you mentioned, Jose, at the end, um, Turkey and Iran scratching their heads and being unhappy. How unhappy are they? Do they see this as a political problem? Or do they see this as potentially, particularly in the case of Iran, a military problem? Well, I think, especially in the case of Iran, less so in the case of Turkey, but not totally not in the case of Turkey, because Turkey is, is in a situation where it can face the UAE on the battlefield as well, both in Libya and maybe also in the, con in the context of the conflict they have with Greece uh, and in other places as well. But, uh, but first of all, I, I say Iran, is, is concerned uh, that it will play out also in the context of a military uh, confrontation. Uh, they realize that uh, UAE is much closer to Iran than, uh, than Israel. Uh, and it, uh, it has an effect on, on the capabilities of Israel to, to uh, collect information. It has an impact on the capability of Israel to carry out of all kinds of uh, uh, military moves that it might want to, to carry out. Uh, so they definitely look at that uh, from this angle. And uh, some uh, Iranians said, every move that Israel is going to make against us, we shall consider it as, uh, as if the UAE did it against us. Uh, they're trying to deter the, the, the UAE. I don't think that, that plays uh, very well in, in Dubai. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, the, they, they are afraid from the, from the military consequences of uh, something like that, not just from the other uh, issues. Now, they don't, there's no direct battle right now between the UAE and the, and the Iranians, with maybe the exception of Yemen uh, through proxies because the Emiratis move, moved away, and the, so they're not involved directly. Uh, but uh, uh, but they realize that even in a, in a place like Yemen, if Israel decides for some reason to, to get more involved in helping with intelligence and things like that, uh, we, we are a regional military power or maybe even a superpower. Uh, we enjoy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran what everybody would like to enjoy, which is uh, intelligence dominance. We know what we need to know on time. That's, uh, that's something that's extremely important. Nobody else has it. I'm, I, I'm not even sure about the United States. Uh, because if I look at what happened in, uh, in Saudi Arabia exactly a year ago, 
uh, with the attacks on Aramco, uh, somebody didn't know that something like that is coming. And, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that we can solve problems there, but we at least, I guess, know how to, uh, how to handle this matter. I am not, I, we cannot guarantee anybody full coverage. But, uh, but if we shall be able to make it more difficult for the Iranians to threaten oil facilities in the Persian Gulf, it's, it's a major change in the equilibrium between uh, of the balance between them and, the, and the, the Gulf countries. Because right now, they, these countries are extremely vulnerable, as, we, as was shown last year. So, so it's, uh, this is a major change, I think. So you mentioned that Israelis all have friends in the UAE, and that's the way that works. So when you look at intelligence cooperation or military cooperation, potential military cooperation, is this something that needs to get started now, or is this something that's been working its way up the system for a while? No, it was already working up the system for a while, of course. Uh, as you know, we don't uh, cooperate on intelligence only with the countries we have uh, formal diplomatic relations with. Uh, but that said, the, the, le the level of cooperation can uh, go up considerably, considerably. And uh, because there are all kinds of things that you do and all kinds of things you don't do when, uh, when you have uh, relations, diplomatic relations, or you don't. And uh, I think that uh, it, it's going to, to improve dramatically. Great. Let's consider the Europeans for a moment, specifically the EU. Um, we have two questions involved here. One is, how are they responding? Do they see it as a setback for their position, which has always been the land for peace position, the Israeli withdrawal position? And secondly, we saw last week that the EU threatened Serbia, that if it opened an embassy in Jerusalem, it wouldn't be able to go forward with EU membership because no EU member has an embassy in Jerusalem. So are the Europeans sticking their fingers where they don't belong? Are they congratulating Israel and the UAE? What are they doing these days? Well, they are congratulating uh, Israel and the UAE on the, on the move, but it is, it is such a cold congratulation. <laughs> it's hard to, to accept it as a, as a real congratulation. It's, it's amazing. They, they definitely, they are frustrated. I mean, this leaves them. It's, it's so strange. The Arabs are telling the Palestinians to change, and the Europeans are the only people around on earth that are telling the Palestinians, don't change, don't change. Stick to this old paradigm that doesn't work. Continue to suffer. We shall give you money. Don't worry. We shall give you money. But uh, just don't change. And uh, it, it is beyond, you know, I once sat with the uh, ambassador of the EU in Israel. And I, I told him, we, we, are, we were friends. And I told him, can you show me where is your money going to? You, you invest in Israel. Uh, you give all kinds of donations to all kinds of And he showed me that <laughs> it was really amazing. I told him, listen, this is really ridiculous. All your money goes on groups that have no impact in Israel. It's uh, all these uh, extreme left. Uh, why do you waste your money? Don't you understand you're on the, on the wrong side of uh, where the things are going? And, uh, and uh, they like to be there. Look, they, they, uh, they spend so much money on organizations that uh, are actually BDS organizations and uh, spend so much money on uh, organizations, those BDS organizations that are actually affiliated with, uh, with terror groups. And uh, when they, just according to formality, where they, they approach these organizations, them, listen, we, according to our rules, we cannot give you money if you give it to people who are actually part of a terror organization. So the, all these groups, 130 groups said, uh, no, 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 we are not going to accept this uh, condition. Uh, we don't call them terror organizations, and we insist that we should not uh, adopt this this rule. And what did the EU, the EU did? Instead of uh, insisting that this is not going to be the, the case, they said, "Okay, we'll give you an exemption." It's, uh, that that's ridiculous. That's that's where the EU is, and uh, that coming back to, to to the issue of Serbia and and Kosovo, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you don't want you don't want to accept Israel, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Fine, it's, uh, it's crazy, it's very strange, 
maybe we should put our uh, embassy in London instead of in, in the UK instead of London, maybe we should put it in Leeds. I don't know. Uh, but uh, who would accept something like that? But to tell somebody else what to do, it's, uh, and this is the condition for uh, being accepted into, into the EU. This is so ridiculous. That's, that's where the Europeans are. It's, it's a very, I don't know, uh, but, but this, is, this is small money. This is small money. And uh, forget about Jerusalem. The fact that they side with the Iranians against the United States and insist on letting the Iranians move towards having a nuclear weapon arsenal with missiles that can hit Europe, while the Iranians boast in their capability to launch missiles <laughs> with nuclear weapons to, uh, to, to Europe. And nevertheless, they, say, they stand with Iran against the United States. This is beyond my understanding. They, they just hate the United States under Trump so much that they will uh, side with Iran against it. Well, they, they do, and they don't care much for you either. So No, uh, we, we, but they don't, we, don't buy, we don't build anything on them. It, uh, so we were not frustrated, but but the United States needed the, the yeah. EU on, on, on that uh, issue. They couldn't get their support. Yep. Yes, our best friends, the British, the French, supposed to be our friends. With friends like that. Yeah, right. We'll look for other friends. Um, on the question of the application of sovereignty in the West Bank. So Bibi made a speech after the announcement of the accord with the UAE in which he said, this was not a land for peace deal. This is a peace for peace deal. And I've always said, he was saying, um, peace for peace is the way to go. But at the end of the day, here's the question. Um, isn't it still a land for peace deal because it forces Israel, at least for the moment, not to move forward with sovereignty and secure borders? No, because we were not able to do that anyhow. It's not because of the we, we don't uh, extend the sovereignty because of the because of the agreement. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with the agreement. We were not able to extend sovereignty because of the uh, U.S. administration approach. It was them that decided not to support the move. Why? Nobody knows. But many many reasons can be uh, uh, used in order to explain it. Uh, but they decided not to not to allow us to move forward, and without the U.S. support, we cannot do it. So uh, maybe because uh, Trump was losing uh, approval rates in the, in the states, maybe because uh, he was upset that some strange people in, in Israel were were speaking against it from the right wing, <laughs> from the right wing, and he was worried that this is going to affect the the, the support of his own base. Uh, maybe because he was uh, unhappy with the fact that Israel doesn't have a full uh, political support for that, and uh, that the blue and white were not totally supportive of it. Uh, they support, they support the idea, but not the uh, not the timing and not the way we, it's going to implement to be implemented and so on. So, uh, and of course, he was not happy with the Jordanian reaction and with the uh, European reaction and with the, of course, the Palestinian reaction, but. I would say most of these things were expected in the in advance. That we, the, these were not a big surprise. Uh, maybe with the exception of uh, the attitude of some of the settlers, uh, everything else was uh, was to be expected. So when they gave the green line in the beginning, they should have known what to expect. Nevertheless, things have changed. And the, the one other thing that was not expected was that uh, Corona came and uh, all kinds of things happened. That. Uh, uh, Took the, the the attention away from uh, from the Israeli moves and uh, had to be dealt with in a more urgent manner. So anyhow, we couldn't do it. That's, uh, we couldn't do it, and, and that's why this was not something we gave to the UAE. If the UAE wants to say that they that they were giving it, uh, let them uh, boast in it. I, I don't have any problem with that. For them, it's a good excuse vis-à-vis -vis the Palestinians to say, "We saved you, <laughs> and you criticize us." It's, uh, Okay, but those who saved them were the Americans, in fact. And, uh, that is so, so internally, though, if Bibi was at an impasse with the president and the application of sovereignty wasn't going to happen, how big a political deal is this for him? That is this a big win, the UAE? Does this really yes, it help is. his position? Because of all the reasons I mentioned before, we want a strong, pragmatic uh, camp. We want to be integrated into the region. We want the Palestinians to feel that they don't have bargaining uh, uh, clips for uh, for, for uh, 
forcing their ideas upon us and that they will have to change their attitude so that we shall have real peace with the Palestinians. We want peace with them. Uh, and this is very good for the chances of peace. So from all these, and also internally, I think uh, people are happy that uh, Bibi made this happen. Uh, so it's, uh, I think for, for Israel, it's, uh, I don't know about Bibi, but, uh, but for Israel, it's a good move. And if it's a good move, and the, the prime minister at the time was such a good move, it's maybe it's also probably also a good move for him. Uh, and, and he didn't pay a great price. He paid the price with uh, something that was not his. He couldn't, uh, he didn't have the uh, application of sovereignty available for him. So it, he, he paid the price. The other questionable issue is the, the, the issue of the F-35, on which is, uh, Israel opposes the, the idea of sending them. And, uh, and now uh, the new line that you hear from Jerusalem is that we count on President Trump to make the right decision that will take into account Israel's security. Okay, I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, well, we, we count on President Trump, anyhow, what, what we do. Uh, but, uh, but the prices are, are, at the end of the day, you can't have a free lunch, right? That's, uh, you got to pay something. It's also true for the UAE, as I said before. It's also true for us. We, we cannot have something for nothing. And uh, so we have to pay something. We didn't pay on, uh, on sovereignty because we didn't have sovereignty. And what's going to happen in the next four years, we shall see. If, I mean, if Biden is elected, this issue is not going to be discussed. If, uh, probably. But if uh, Trump is going to be elected, this issue is going to be discussed. I don't know what are going to be the, uh, the results of the discussion, but uh, it's definitely going to be discussed in the, in the next four years. And there are, just as I said before, that there are all kinds of, partial uh, normalization that we can live with. We don't need everybody to have full diplomatic relations and open up an embassy in, in Jerusalem. Uh, then there is also partial uh, application of the sovereignty. We can, uh, we can do all kinds of in between, all kinds of things in between, like have more uh, construction in, the, in these areas, uh, move forward in preparing the infrastructure for the implementation of the Trump plan, like building all the intersections that uh, have to be built in order to allow this uh, strange uh, uh, tiger-like uh, leopard uh, situation uh, be uh, feasible. So we, we have to, buy, to build all kinds of uh, intersections uh, that will allow roads to go up and down. And, uh, and there's a lot of things that we can do. We can even my, my suggestion would be that we shall adopt the Edmund Levy report. I don't know if you, uh, this, is for, this is not for class one, this is for class three. Uh, but this is a report that was prepared some eight years ago and uh, was, was prepared for the government by a committee led by uh, Judge Edmund Levy from the Supreme Court that uh, uh, looked at the situation of the ownership of land in the Judean Samaria territories. And, uh, and came up with all kinds of solutions that because it was not discussed by the government in the last ten, eight years, we suffer from all kinds of problems in the, in the territories. And this uh, report can solve many of the problems without dealing with the question of uh, sovereignty. So as we're speaking, a very large thunderstorm with a lot of lightning has just arrived on the top of my house. And oh. I'm, I'm afraid that we're going to get knocked off the air here in a minute. So. And in any event, we've come to the, to the end of our program. So let me ask you a short question to close while I still have connectivity on my computer and my roof is still attached to my house. Um, clearly, it's the intention of Israel and the UAE to bring further partners into this. Um, some of them will be formal partners. Some of them will be like Saudi Arabia for the moment, an informal partner where Israel gets certain benefits, but maybe they don't sign a peace treaty. Okay, if you were picking who would you say are the next countries that are likely to enter a formal agreement with Israel? Who's hot? Well, I think the Sudan is the hottest, uh, but uh, the Sudan is ready to do that. The current leadership is ready to do that, but they have some uh, legal obstacles because they are an interim, uh, an interim regime. So they have uh, some uh, problems with how far they can go legally. Uh, but if it was up to them, they would do that. 
they, they do it because they need it. They need our support in Washington and much of it is going to Washington through Tel Aviv. And uh, I just wrote uh, an article a couple of months ago about the need for the United States to take Sudan off the list of terror, group, uh, terror states uh, and to resume aid to, to the Sudan. Uh, and I think that uh, this is the right thing to do. And uh, so I think that Sudan would have been the, the, the first one, but because of the problems, it might be uh, losing this uh, race to, uh, to, to Bahrain, which is also close to accepting it. Uh, although it's, uh, for the Bahrainis, it's more complicated. Uh, I think everybody here looks at Saudi Arabia. And I think that, that the two last moves of Saudi Arabia, allow, first allowing Israeli planes to fly to Abu Dhabi through uh, Saudi airspace, and uh, yesterday allowing Israeli planes to fly to, uh, to the east uh, over Saudi uh, airspace without any restrictions. These are clear signs to everybody, listen, we are in favor of that. We have some limitations of how far we can go, but we are in favor of that. So if any of you want to, to move, don't feel that you need to uh, ask too many questions. Go ahead. And uh, I think uh, Oman, Bahrain, Sudan uh, are listening. And uh, who's going to be the first is this, uh, I don't want uh, somebody who's going to be upset with me in the end. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's a very positive note. I like to end these conversations on a positive note. Um, I hate to leave people feeling like, you know, the sky is falling. So on that note, which is positive, I want to thank you on behalf of all the people that tuned in today and also all the people who will listen to this podcast on our website. As our listeners know, this will be available on the website. Tell your friends, tell them it's definitely a worthwhile way to spend their lunch hour um, listening to today's program. Yossi, thank you very much for a great program. And thank, thank you, you all for listening. And thank you, everybody, for listening.